so much new ground covered Sunday uh, for people. I'm sure that that was very new for a lot of people. And in some ways, when you're being introduced to what the Bible has taught for 2,000 years, but it's new to you, then there's a, there's a process then of embracing that knowledge and re-embracing that knowledge until it becomes something that you can really comprehend, understand, see in the Word of God. You can then begin to see it throughout the Word of God. And what it does is it establishes a truth in you. And the importance of that, the process of doing that, is that once you're established in a truth, you can then rely on it. But it's, it's a, something that has to become implanted. The scripture says the implanted word of God. And so we want the word to be implanted. We want the word of God to get deeper than just our thoughts. That it would actually literally touch our spirit man and begin to produce results. And the, the revelation of the glory of God is so big. I'm not talking about extravagant in layers of knowledge. I'm talking it's so big in effect. The effect of it is so huge. And so I just want to look at a couple things here with you. Uh, if you look at John chapter 5, yeah, and we'll, if we pick up, yeah, I guess about verse 17 will work. Uh, but Jesus answered them, my father has been working until now, and I have been working. Therefore the Jews saw all the more to kill him, because he not only broke the Sabbath, but he also said that God was his father, therefore making himself equal with God. And so in the Jewish mind, in the Jewish understanding, you have to understand the culture of the Jewish people, uh, family lineage was everything. Who you were born of was your ticket. Uh, in their mind, you know, they would always claim to be the children of Abraham. Because Abraham was the man whom God promised the blessing that would bless the whole world. You can read it in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 3, where there's seven covenant promises that God made with Abraham there that was going to affect the whole human race, but it was going to affect the human race through the lineage of Abraham. And so he spoke about the lineage of Abraham as a starting block that he says, in you all the nations of the world will be blessed. This language in you is talking about your seed, the children that were going to come from you. So every son that was born, every child that was born, uh, became an opportunity, another opportunity for that to take place. And the, the girls as well, because when the girls had a, a, a child, then that child had the opportunity to become the Messiah. So they were all looking for the promised seed. They were all looking for the Christ, the seed of God, the anointed seed of heaven. They were all looking for that. The whole nation was busy with purification for the purpose of receiving the purified seed of God. One of the greatest things that was accomplished under the Old Covenant was the fact that the, uh, the Old Covenant and the Old Covenant manner of dealing with sin was purification through blood of sacrifice of animals. But nonetheless, there was a purification. It didn't purify to the cleansing of the conscience, but it did cleanse the person from death and made them ceremonially clean that in order that they could be used of God. So God uh, set up um, this system basically to wash the people. You know, he had to cleanse them from their sins on a, an exterior level at least so that he could then pour his prophetic word through them, accomplish his mighty deeds through them, and his purposes would be fulfilled. And so the, one of the greatest things that ever happened under the law was that God purified Mary, the mother of Jesus, under the law. This young woman came up under the law, purified by the blood of animals, and she became available to God for use. And she said yes to carrying the seed of heaven. Wow. Here's the daughter of Abraham. Yeah. Here's one in his lineage all the way down who finally appears. I wonder how many people God spoke to. They were like, what? This is crazy. Maybe walked away. You don't believe it, but I, I can show you in the Bible where many people walked away from the call of God. And God would call someone else. And it doesn't say anything about Mary, but I always wonder about these things. But she, in the lineage of Abraham, stood there before God and said, be it unto me according to your will. And she was a purified vessel from God under the law 
presented holy to receive the Christ, the seed of heaven, to come into her and produce God and man into a union which would change the whole entire world. It's amazing what God promised Abraham. So it's, it's an amazing thing, and what we're trying to make the discovery in the Word is that Christ is not Jesus' last name. It wasn't Chris Scarinzi or Jesus Christ. I don't know if you knew this, but the word Christ is actually an adjective. Now, that might burst somebody's bubble. What? Adjectives aren't the proper name. Can't be true. No, Christ is an adjective in the Greek language. I hate to inform you that, but it's actually better that it is, and I'll tell you why. Because it's not speaking of a, of a proper title or name. It's speaking of a quality and a nature of life. So if, if I say, that's a truck, you go, okay. But if I say that's a beautiful truck, you go, all right, no, okay, it's a beautiful truck. So beautiful is an adjective. Christ is an adjective. This is Jesus Christ. This is beautiful Jesus you see, it's a word that is starting to put some definition to the quality of the one it's talking about. And Christ means anointed. Jesus Christ, he's the anointed one. He's human and he's born of God. He's the son of man and he's the son of God. He is all man and all God in one body. And he is carrying the seed of heaven in him. Therefore, he's the Christ. He's anointed. So this man, Jesus, was anointed because the seed of heaven was in him. When you got born again, the seed of heaven entered you, and you became anointed. And I'll go change your name to Chris Christ. People do in Africa. I, I know people. They've all changed their name to the last name to Christ because they don't understand it's an adjective, not a last name. But when you were born again, it says you were born of an incorruptible seed of the word of heaven, of the word of God. God's seed that birthed Christ is the same seed that birthed you. And you now are in the holy anointing of Christ. Christ, the mystery Paul said, is Christ in me. The hope of glory so if you want glory, look in here, where God put his seed. Right. You're not looking at the flesh, you're looking at the seed of heaven that entered into your spirit. You are carrying Christ, not Jesus, Christ. Jesus is the man. Christ is the anointed, beautiful life of God. Isn't that awesome? You're carrying Christ. Now that's profound. It is the highest thing you can say for man. There's nothing higher we can say. All right, I'm going to show you in Ephesians chapter 1. Because it's still, it's a hard concept to accept because it seems too high. And somebody might say, well, you're making too much of man. No, God made a lot of man. I love Hebrews chapter 2. It says, God is mindful of man. See, his mind is full of man. He's not thinking about angels. He's thinking about man. God is ever conscious of his people. This is what occupies Father. Um, do you know something? I can work really, really hard all day. I can go hunting or fishing. I can go and I like planting crops and doing stuff like that sometimes. And I just can get, do things, right? I can travel overseas, which I often do. And I can get into, uh, busy with everything. But I never forget my children. Never. I'm always thinking, what are they doing? Are they okay? Just during worship, I reached back and touched Eve on the leg. I said, you're so blessed, Eve. Why is she blessed? Well, she's my daughter. <laughs> There's no other reason. So uh, I said, remember last Sunday, I had Christy stand up. She was in the back there. And I said, aren't any of my kids here? I guess they were here. I couldn't see them under the balcony there. And, uh, and Christy stood up. I says, she's my glory. It's because she's my image. She is my likeness. You see, um, so your children are... <laughs> Children are the glory of their parents. 
This is why we fight so hard for our children, because they naturally are us. So, have you ever thought about if you took your little rascally kid and yanked your spouse out, it'd be you. <laughs> That's your mother. <laughs> oh, there's me. <laughs> no, I just kid. You understand, you, if you could pull, do you know DNA? You are, you are 100% your mother and 100% your father. You're not 50-50. You're 100%. The two come together 100% to form a new person. And when God joined himself to man, 100% God, 100% man. They jo we joined God. God forever linked himself to man. There's no possibility of separation. You understand? So Jesus became the firstborn you know how the scripture says he's the only begotten of the Father? Because he was. Not anymore. We are begotten of the seed of the word of God. You see, he was the only begotten. Now there's many begotten of the seed of the word of God. He was begotten and we were begotten. He's the firstborn. Many were coming after him. He, that's why he's not ashamed to call us brothers. So we think, well, Jesus is our brother. Yes, he is. The Bible declares he's our brother. When you're standing in heaven, in the heavenly realm, you're standing beside Jesus. Yeah. Our eldest brother, who won our salvation, who set the course for all of us to follow. Yeah. We applaud him. He saved us. But we are now in the salvation of our Father. Yeah. We're birthed from above. Christ is in us, the hope of glory. Can you say Christ is in me? Christ all right, Ephesians chapter 1. This scripture is like a mind blower. <laughs> You can read it a hundred times. I've probably read this scripture 500 times in my life. And it wasn't until recently that I actually heard part of it. <laughs> I was like, what? Yeah. It says, uh, Ephesians 1, 17. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's a statement. Yeah. You know, Jesus has a God. Right. Yeah. That ought to just work on you a little bit. Just let that just filter in. Is you can feel like that doesn't even fit your, your doctrinal comprehension. Oh, wait a minute. He's not a, he doesn't have a God. He is God. Well, the Bible says he has a God. That's which born of God is God, but he has a God. He says about his father, he's greater in me than authority. I don't do anything without him. Without him, I can do nothing. That sounds like superiority. But he says, I am what I am because of him. But I, I have been granted all authority because of him. That's powerful, right? Okay, that's just the first part. The second part is what I enjoy the most. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory. He's the Father of glory. That means your glory. <laughs> you know, all right, picture Jesus. I can't handle that. All right, here's Jesus. Here's the Father. Father's greater than him. He fathered him. He is man and God joined together. He is God not joined with man. Jesus is God joined to man. Man's over here, and man is not God, and man is not Jesus or, or God joined to man. Jesus is man joined to God. So God's on that side. We're on this side. And then God says, because of what he is and what he's going to do for you on the cross and what he's going to fulfill, I'm inviting you into a relationship with me, which is exactly the same as his. And so we receive, because of the work of Christ, the seed of Christ came into us and we joined the ranks of our eldest brother, Jesus. Because of him, we stand as sons, Christ's own seed in the earth. We are the sons of our Father. We are the glory of our Father. Can you say he's the Father of glory? Now give this a try. He's the Father of glory. Oh, gee, I know. It's like people are like, well, I don't know if I could say that. I don't know if I could say that. That's a stretch, Pastor Chris. No, it's Bible. Do you know what I believe true humility is? 
Let me tell you what false humility is. To get born again and say you're less than Christ. That's false humility. True humility is to say, I have become a member of God. I am in the family of Christ. I am the seed of God. I am a seed of God. I'm born of God. I am in the kind of God. I am in him. I am his child. I'm his type. That's humility. Humility means to submit to the ridiculously successful word of God. It's so successful, you feel like you're prideful and saying, I'm, not, I'm low, I'm no good. <laughs> That's pride. Humility is, it doesn't feel right, Lord, because I think about what I've done in my life and it doesn't seem to match what you're saying you've made me to be, but I submit to you what I am. If you say I'm holy, I'm holy. Can you say he's the father of glory? Oh, quit boasting. Quit boasting. (laughs) He's the father of glory. Do you know, this gospel has been so watered down that I can read you Bible and you can struggle with Bible. It really, it challenges us. It challenges us. Um, Your inner man rejoices. Your outer man goes, whoa, whoa. Whoa, do you know what I did today? Do you know what he did for you? This is the covenant that God made with you. Is it true or not? This is the covenant I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. Their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. You think, why did he do that? Because he wanted a foolproof salvation so he could relate to you without interruption. That powerful. He wanted fellowship so bad, he didn't want to get robbed of you by some foolish thing that you might go and do. So he made a foolproof salvation that's not dependent upon you, it's dependent upon him. And then he gives you the faith to believe it. (laughs) That's really, it's, it's it's like an amazing gospel. All right, so before I just run out of time because it get happy, clappy, preaching the gospel. Um... All right, so maybe there's someone you have like a thought or a question that you might like to pose that relates to the subject. Go ahead. Yes, sir. In kind, it is in kind. Yes, important, uh, important point. The word in the Greek when he said equal, the word equal, it has to do with equal in kind. In other words, generational birth. So the sons of Abraham are of Abraham. Sons of God are of, of God. If he's God, then we are. That's why, this, don't get stuck on this, but that's why the scripture says we are gods. It's not we are not superior beings over everything. It, it means that you're of the God kind. You're of his generation. You're birthed like his nature. What he is is what we are in the spirit. We are now true sons, not pretend sons. You're not patched on, you've been recreated. It's a new creation. uh, Thank you for that. Yeah. So, Father God is in full authority. Jesus Christ is our Savior. We're not the Savior of the world. He's the Savior. We don't worship each other. We worship him and the Father. They are the ones that did the work, not us. But nonetheless, they're our brother and our father. It's like an amazing thing. We got a great family. Okay? Our father has responsibility. Yeah. Jesus has responsibility. Mm -hmm. We have responsibility. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, I think what Leon's saying is that if God has responsibilities, Jesus has responsibilities, certainly we have responsibilities. And I, I think that. Um, responsibility, the level of it or the authority level of it is determined by revelatory knowledge. The greater your revelation, the greater responsibility and accountability you have for that. So as we grow, we grow in accountability. Like even when you first walk into the church, you have no responsibility to the church, to the people, nothing. You come in, you're a visitor, and you're like, hi, nice to see you. 
Either you like it or you don't. You leave or you stay. You know, you, you just have to decide all the things. You have no responsibility other than be a Christian, be, be honorable and gracious and not offensive in any way. And, uh, but then when you come and you come and you come, eventually your responsibility level grows as you are signifying yeah. your connection to the body of Christ. You see that? So I think we have to understand... But then as you grow in Christ, you start realizing your responsibility is to the entire kingdom of God. You start realizing, hey, this thing is bigger than I thought. Now I have a connection. This church is my joint that supplies. That's my next joint where I'm connected. But my connection to the larger purpose of God is through that, but it's still to the whole. And so you grow with revelation comes responsibility. As, re as time goes, revelation grows. Yes, Karen. What does it mean to be humble? In other words, um, high-mindedness is the opposite of humility. High-mindedness has to be defined this way. Not that we see ourselves high because God has placed us high. High-mindedness means to think thoughts which contradict God's. The whole thing started in the garden uh, when he said, you shall not eat of the tree of the knowledge and good, of good and evil. And then they went and ate of an alternate knowledge from God's. All they knew is what God said. Till they ate of that tree, then they knew other knowledge came. Other knowledge about good and bad. Good is bad and bad is bad. They're both bad because they are not God's knowledge. They're an alternate source of knowledge. So when, when God speaks, his word is true. So I want to align my life with his word. And when I do, it puts me into, it, it causes me to have harmony with mankind. It causes me to be a blessing and a and a. a uh, a benefit to humanity and to my brothers as well. Uh, but when I have high-mindedness, I set aside the Word of God and I go for my alternate knowledge, whatever it might be out there. I, I was just telling Nicolette, is she here? And she's out there. I was just saying to her, I said, Nicola, I'm so proud of you. She said, you are? Why? She said, you know, you're looking right through me. <laughs> You know, you get the Holy Spirit gaze going on. And uh, like, because she's a perfect example of someone who's not high-minded. Philosophically, um, when we met her, she had a worldview which was not from the Bible. I mean, we're talking politically, we're talking uh, humanitarianly, we're talking about the earth and about everything in this earth and in the world, about spiritual truth and authority. All those things, she was over there and the word of God was here. But somehow, because she's not high-minded, she went, gunk, and heard the revelation of heaven and received Christ. And I remember those months, first months and years of her salvation, she had a different take on life. It wasn't a biblical worldview. It was a world-cast view from man. But through the years, you watched her change, 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 and adapt uh, an idea and a concept that's based on truth. And I said to her, that's why I'm so proud of you. She's not high-minded. She kept submitting her thoughts, however strong they were, to God. If your political views don't change, you're not submitting to God. Our political views ought to change. If your ideas about life and what is correct in relationally in marriage and in dating and in courtship and out there in this world doesn't change, then you're, you're not, you're high-minded. You're keeping thoughts above God's thoughts. So I hope that helps. So you, he is the father of glory. He has fathered us. That gives him total right and permission to adjust us. And so I, I think we should look to the Lord for truth and let our ways be amended. So last thought on that. Um, if high-mindedness is to do everything I just said, um, then humility or cooperation with God is just that, to allow him to be our leader and our teacher and the one who orients our thoughts and not us. Amen. Praise the Lord. You, you, you enjoy this teaching on Christ. It's... It's like so pointed. I mean, all right. You know, so let's, I, I just warn you about this. Don't try to burst these things on people who have no knowledge of anything. Uh, they have all these things they got to learn first. I'm talking to you. We've done lots of teaching and training so that you could understand. And you might be surprised how many things I avoided while I was talking. 
so that I didn't cast a thought that leads your mind into something I'm not talking about. I was, and even what Ken said about the equality, it's a, it's a quality in nature and kind, not an equality of authority in, in that way. God is God, we're under him, but we are of him, just like a father and a son. My father was a greater authority than I. He, he birthed me and raised me I didn't birth me and raise me. So I give him honor. He didn't give me honor. I gave him honor. He was above me in every way. And so, but yet I am an offspring of his. I carry his image. In fact, every day I look more like him. It's scary. It's really scary. And then his actions are now, it's like I'm morphing into him. It's like he used to go like this and rub his belly right here, and I think, why do you do that, Dad? Now I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you know, it's, it, there's a reason. It's in my makeup. Yeah. It's in my DNA. There's a natural outcome that tries to now demonstrate the author <laughs> of me, my dad. So you have an amazing spiritual father. Is God. And he has birthed inside of you his very divine nature and character. And as you allow him to have his way, his likeness is going to manifest to you in everything in life. Praise the Lord. All right, well, um, we're going to uh, switch gears. And so we want to thank the people on live stream who've been with us tonight. Appreciate you coming along. Uh, we're going to leave you here now because going to shift into our business meeting and uh, so thank you.